This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. With President Obama easing travel and other restrictions against Cuba, former Congressman Mike Barnes, an expert on Latin America, says his actions will speed the island's move toward democracy. In the wake of the Charlie Hebdo massacre, human rights expert Eric Posner explains the importance of freedom of expression. And Bill Press talks about LBJ and MLK with historian Kent Germany. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Latin America expert Mike Barnes says the opening to Cuba will be on history's list of President Obama's top ten hits. And we say hello to former Congressman Mike Barnes of Maryland, who chaired the Subcommittee on Western Hemisphere Affairs and was a member of the Kissinger Commission on Central America. Subsequent to his congressional service, he has practiced law and served as president of the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence, and he is currently a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. Congressman Mike Barnes, thanks very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Yeah, great to be with you again. Always nice to speak with you as well. Uh, as an expert on Latin America, do you think the move to normalize relations with Cuba is entirely positive? It's hard to see really any element of it that isn't positive. It's uh, extremely positive with respect to our relations with our neighbors in the hemisphere. Uh, they've really been beating up on us over this issue for a long time. I was at a conference in Washington in uh, oh, November, December, uh, uh, of people from all leaders from all over the hemisphere, from Canada all the way down uh, through uh, Central America, South America, the Caribbean. And one of the big agenda items was uh, the anachronism of the U.S. embargo and U.S. Uh, efforts to isolate Cuba. Uh, as, as you know, there's going to be a, a summit of the Americas in, in the spring in Panama. And, and for the first time, Cuba has been invited to participate. And this was, they, it was, they were invited, you know, President Castro, Raul Castro was invited months ago. And uh, there was some question as to whether the U.S. would show up. Uh, because, you know, in the past, we've always said, if the Cubans can't come, we won't. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we were the fathers of this concept of, of summits, of, of, of hemispheric summits. And it would have been just really awful if, if there had been a summit and we didn't go and Cuba did. Right. But in any event, this obviates that. Obviously, uh, Obama will be there and uh, President Castro will be there. And this takes an issue off the table uh, for our relationships with our friends throughout the hemisphere who have been very critical of our approach to this. And it really um, helps us dramatically in that respect. Obviously, also, it opens the, the prospects of, of uh, a, chain, a whole change in the dynamic with, with Cuba, which is, um, uh, I guess, the main reason it was done. But but as, as someone who follows what's going on in the rest of the hemisphere, I was particularly pleased that, with that aspect of it. What do you think we can expect in the short run out of diplomatic relations? I mean, ob besides the obvious rum and cigars. Well, I, I think in the very short run, you're not going to see a lot of very specific things. They're, they're the obvious, you know, release of of, of Alan Gross, who uh, is, an, is a resident of my old congressional district, and so I've been involved in the efforts peripherally. I've been involved not directly the way. The person who currently holds that seat, Chris Van Hollen, has. Chris was on the plane that went down to get Alan Gross and bring him home. Mm -hmm. But that's wonderful for him and his family that, that he was released. And that wouldn't have happened without this. But there, and there are the other aspects of the, uh, of the agreement that are, that are very positive in, in terms of you know, the release of political prisoners in Cuba, which we're watching closely to make sure it, it happens the way it was agreed to. Um, but I'll tell you, I spend a lot of time in South Florida, and the business community in South Florida is just uh, ecstatic about the, the possibilities here. 
Um, there are all these charter, uh, you know, flight companies that are already flying Cuban families back and forth and whatnot. On, but now they see the potential, and, and already just because of all the excitement about this uh, announcement by President Obama and President Castro, you, are, you already see large numbers of people wanting to go to Cuba out of curiosity. Cuba's so much in the news right now that the interest is much greater, and so all over. Florida business people, people who are in the export business are thinking about that. People in the uh, cruise line business, which is largely centered in, in South Florida, are obviously excited about the possibility of taking cruise ships into Havana. So there's just a, a lot of um, enthusiasm about this, this progress that's being made in the relationship. We're speaking with former Maryland Congressman Mike Barnes, uh, currently a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. In the long term, do you think Cuba might become a democratized and and then become closer to the United States in world affairs and the domestic economy? Sure. I think that's almost inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it will happen. I remember back in the um, late 80s or 90s, I forget exactly, early 90s maybe, uh, Lech Wałęsa came on a visit to the United States, the, uh, the president of, of Poland, who had been a leader of the uh, of the group that opened up Poland from communist dictatorship. And he visited Miami and he met with uh, a lot of the leaders of the Cuban-American community. And they asked him for his advice. What should we do to, you know, to get rid of the Castros and bring democracy to, to Cuba? And he said, he said, overwhelm them with tourists and trade and and communications and he said a communist dictatorship cannot withstand it uh he said that's really was a key to to what happened in poland that when when there began to be an opening to the west it couldn't be contained and it allowed the labor movement in in poland to have relationships with the afl-cio and other labor groups around the world and 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 it just it, it, it cracked through the communist dictatorship, and he, he, that was his advice to the Cuban Americans. That's not what they wanted to hear at that time, and they rejected it. And um, some of them still reject it. Um, witness uh, <laughs> the senator from Florida, Marco Rubio, and the former governor of Florida, Jeb Bush. They still don't want to hear the, the advice that Life of Windsor gave. But it was absolutely correct, and and democracy will come to Cuba. And this will speed it up. What President Obama has done here is a terrific thing for the future of the people of Cuba. Was this a one-sided move with, with President Obama simply deciding to do it, or did Cuba have to offer some concessions? Oh, I, well, the, the administration made very clear. Uh, and I was peripherally uh, involved in, uh, not in the negotiations, obviously, but, but over the past years I've been talking with people at the White House and and about you know how these things could could come about and the cubans of course were demanding the release of of the three remaining members of the cuban five who were still in jail in the united states and we were demanding the release of alan gross and we also demanded the the uh release of this uh former cuban intelligence official who'd been in prison down there for i think like 20 years um who had been working for us he right. Was, uh, he'd been on our payroll, and and we weren't going to let those three guys out of jail here if they didn't let this this Cuban American who had done so much to help uh, America to help the United States. If they weren't going to let him out, and they, and they did, and and uh, you know there are other aspects of it, but there were some you know very obvious, tangible uh, steps here that were positive for for the United States. What do you think this move means for U.S. relations with other Latin American countries that are already allied with Cuba, such as Venezuela? Well, I think it, I think it actually hurts. Uh, it hurts the Venezuelans and some of the other leftists in in uh, Latin America who have used this issue of the U.S. embargo, which of course remains in effect, but the U.S. failure to recognize Cuba and deal with Cuba. As a as a as a way to poke us in the eye and and say that you know we're the we're the one the country that's out of step with the rest of the hemisphere, which is true. We were totally out of step. Everybody else in the hemisphere had relations with Cuba. We're the only ones that didn't. Um, so I, I think uh, 
in that sense, it, it, it takes that away from them, makes it makes us look much more magnanimous and, and much more, uh, you know, open to dealing with the world as it is, uh, just as we've dealt with Vietnam and China and other communists in the past. Um, so I, I think it actually is, is very helpful in terms of uh, continuing to isolate some of these uh, wacky leftists in, in Latin America like Maduro and, and others. And again, we're speaking with uh, former Maryland Congressman Mike Barnes, uh, currently senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. Does this action take away an issue for Republicans, perhaps put them in a box since there doesn't seem to really be a good reason for maintaining the embargo? Well, I, I sure hope so. It appears that's the case. I tell you, I've talked to, as I said, I spent a lot of time in South Florida. And I've talked to so many Republicans who can't understand why Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio and the rest of these Republicans continue to remain so, uh, you know, whatever the right word is, um, to the to the Cuban American community that doesn't want to see an opening to Cuba. Most Cuban Americans do, by the way. The polling shows that Obama won a majority of Cuban Americans. Uh, in the in the last election in, in Florida, and um, so Rubio and Bush are, are out of step with their own constituency, uh, not just the Cuban Americans, but Republicans uh, generally supported what the president did here, and uh, uh, I think it, it does uh, put the Republican Party in a bit of a box if they nominate uh, Rubio or Bush or some some other Republican who is a strong opponent of what President Bush, uh, President Obama did here, um, I, I think uh, that's, that's not going to be a very positive thing for the candidate. Yeah, that's certainly something they'll have to answer. That's for sure. Um, before we let you go, why do you think this took so long? Well, uh, it, it was the politics of it. Um, uh, you know, there are two areas of the country where you have very significant Cuban American pop populations. Obviously, Florida. A lot of people are not aware that that New Jersey is is another one. And uh, Senator Menendez from New Jersey, Democrat, um, was chairman of the Foreign uh, Relations Committee in the Senate, and he, uh, he he's just as strong <laughs> on the side of of not doing anything as uh, as as Republicans are, like like Bush and Rubio. And uh, so the politics of it within the Congress were difficult. And um, and over the years, you know, Jimmy Carter wanted to do something uh, and that got undermined by by events. Bill Clinton wanted to wanted to do something that got undermined by events. I don't think President uh, either of President Bush has really had any interest in, in changing the policy. But. Um, uh, but it, it, it was, it's really a shame that it took so long because I really do believe that had we changed this policy 30 or 40 years ago, the Castros would be long gone and Cuba would be uh, a very, very different place today. And the Cuban people would have would have been in better, much better situation. And thank goodness uh, President Obama has done what he's done. I think it's uh, it's going to be you know among his top accomplishments uh, when he finishes his two terms and and it'll, people look back at things he's accomplished uh, you know this will be on a on the list of the top ten hits I think uh, because it's a it's it's so important for for our interests and for the interests of the Cuban people absolutely all right former Congressman Mike Barnes of Maryland currently senior fellow at the Center for International Policy joining us today on America's Democrats dot org. Congressman Barnes, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to doing it again soon. Well, it's a pleasure to, to, to be with you again, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. 
This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. When it comes to human rights, legal expert Eric Posner says freedom of expression trumps them all. And we'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Hey, we're Texas proud these days because Greg Abbott, the incoming governor of our state, has set a new gubernatorial record before he's even been sworn into office. Well, proud isn't quite the right word, since Greg's historic achievement is that he is throwing the most expensive inauguration bash the Lone Star State has ever had. With a parade, concert, ball, four tons of barbecued brisket, and Boku booze flowing freely, he has laid out $4 million for a party to celebrate, who else? Himself. Actually, it's not Abbott's four million buckaroos. The cash largely is coming from the coffers of big oil and other corporate powers. The irony here is that corporations are banned from giving any money to gubernatorial candidates on the ground that those interests have special favors they'll want from the state, so such donations are tantamount to bribery. Yet, the law lets those same corporations gain big brownie points with the gubernatorial winner by lavishing unlimited sums to fund his or her self-congratulatory party. Plus, the law allows this corrupting exchange to be kept secret from the public, which need not even be told the names of the corporate donors and how much they paid. Abbott is hardly alone in playing this shell game. Galas for governors of both parties have become high-dollar opportunities for politicos and corporate interests to bond. Of course, everyone involved loudly denies that inaugural blowouts have become little more than influence-buying bazaars. But methinks they protest too much. The louder they profess their purity, the more obvious their impurity becomes. This is Jim Hightower saying, Besides, these exclusive, ever more extravagant affairs are unseemly, especially in these hard times. Have a little modesty. Just take the oath of office, say a few words, have a low-key reception with a cash bar. Then, get to work. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Much is being debated about freedom of expression. Human rights expert Eric Posner says it's the most important right because it underpins all other rights. And we say hello to Eric Posner, Kirkland and Ellis Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. His current research interests are international law and constitutional law, and his new book is called The Twilight of International Human Rights. Eric Posner, thank you very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. My pleasure. Glad to be here. And it's nice to have you with us. So you have written a book about the legal and legislative history of human rights, but you conclude that pushing a human rights agenda can harm the United States or any country that tries to get another country to clean up its act. How is that so? Well, in practice, the human rights agenda means um, something like a rigid ideal of liberal democracy of the sort that we're familiar with in in the West. Many countries... um, are not uh, really in a position to implement uh, liberal institutions or democratic institutions, often because uh, they have very um, bad institutions themselves, uh, they're corrupt, um, or they often have cultures that embrace illiberal norms. Um, And so, you know, a good example might be Egypt, which, you know, briefly had a democratic flourishing, but has reverted to authoritarianism. Now, uh, it's not that Egypt wouldn't be better, for example, if it had uh, a liberal democracy. The question is whether that's possible in the short or medium term. If it's not, then if the United States simply tried to force Egypt or any country like it to be like a Western country, um, this is most likely to be uh, uh, futile. What would you say is a useful definition of human rights? The definition of human rights is hotly contested, but the basic idea is that we should identify certain human needs or interests that should take priority over others. So a familiar one 
would be the right to freedom of expression or freedom of speech. The idea is that we have a very strong interest in being able to express ourselves, and that, that interest should be uh, protected by a right. And if it's protected by a right, what that means is that other things that we might care about, including social order or certain moral beliefs, have to be subordinated to that right, and so should not be permitted to interfere with the uh, interest in being able to express oneself. We're speaking with Professor Eric Posner of the Chicago, uh, University of Chicago School of Law. Uh, his latest book, The Twilight of International Human Rights, have human rights been increasing in recent years, declining, holding steady, and, and how much of the world would you say is free? Uh, well, according to um, a think tank called Freedom House, uh, 45% of countries in the world are free. W what they roughly mean is that there are elections and freedom of expression and, and that sort of thing. There's definitely more democracy and political liberty today than there was in, say, you know, 1970 or 1980, although over the last uh, 10 years, uh, there's, pro there's probably been a decline in the uh, amount of political freedom. Other things like uh, the amount of torture probably hasn't changed that much uh, over these years. Torture is a, is a problem in most countries and, uh, and will probably continue to be a problem uh, for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for a country to have democratic values and still be a human rights violator? Absolutely. Uh, human rights are defined uh, much more broadly to encompass things uh, beyond democratic values. An example is India. In India is an established democracy with parties, elections, and a free press. But the, the country as a whole um, suffers from an enormous amount of human rights violations. Uh, there are actually millions of people in, in, Israel, in, um, in India who are literally enslaved. Um, there's child labor, uh, significant religious intolerance in many parts of the country, and uh, extreme poverty. So democracy is not the same thing as, as having human rights. Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, or I mean, a lot of countries, friendly or otherwise, um, do they not find it hypocritical for the United States to intervene on behalf of human rights when we have some human rights issues of our own, uh, such as the incarceration rate and, and torture by government agencies? Uh, yes, I do think most countries uh, accuse the United States of hypocrisy. Um, of course, you could probably accuse most countries, maybe all countries of hypocrisy. Um, all countries say that they um, uh, respect human rights, and, and pretty much all countries or almost all countries violate human rights, some much more than others. But I don't actually think that um, hypocrisy is a useful way to look at the problem. The underlying problem is that the human rights regime is, is utopian. It um, aspires for uh, rights and the treatment of people that, that just isn't realistic in the world that we live in. So it's not surprising that countries violate human rights. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, does a country descend into human rights hell because of specific religious or ideological reasons, or is it something intrinsic to human beings who have too much power? The biggest um, source of the of the human rights hell is, is definitely civil war. Civil war is a much more significant problem for rights than uh, dictatorship or authoritarian uh, systems. It'd be much better to live in China, for example, than in Syria. Um, now, authoritarian countries mainly suppress uh, political dissent, and they sometimes suppress religious freedoms and types of uh, association. And this is certainly a bad thing, but it's not nearly as bad as a civil war where there's a huge amount of murder, torture, and other forms of mayhem. Now, one of the key problems with human rights is that when we challenge authoritarian countries because they violate political rights, if we succeed and, they, and, and the countries actually collapse, they won't actually become better. You know, you may, you may get rid of... Um, a regime that violates people's political rights, but you could end up with anarchy. And we have, uh, of course, a number of examples that are quite important, including Syria, Iraq, and Libya. Iraq was the first one that, that jumped out at me as you, as you started to explain that. At, do we have to find the right time, the, the right – I mean, w when there's a civil war going, in, it seems, going on, it seems like the United States steps in 
and starts pushing. And, and it seems like they go in with human rights as the reason for going in. But it can't just be that, right? I mean, are they also at the same time trying to change the political face of these countries? I think what the United States tries to do is reintroduce order into a country where there's civil war, but order of the sort that, that we think is is best for them. And, and that often reflects our values and norms, which which don't always work in these other countries. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a, there's always this tension. Um, do we want this country just to get back to um, a perhaps authoritarian place, but at least where basic human needs are satisfied, or, or do we want to create a, a democracy? And those two goals are often in tension. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eric Posner, Kirkland & Ellis, Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. His uh, new book is called The Twilight of International Human Rights. Eric Posner, thank you so much for joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. We hope to have you back again soon. Thanks very much. It was my pleasure. All right. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, LBJ archivist, Kent Germany. The movie is Selma, the story of the civil rights movement. Many, many people that I talked to were so excited this movie was coming out to finally tell the story of Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, and the other heroes of the civil rights movement. And then they find out that it really um, depicts Lyndon, President Lyndon Baines Johnson as uh, antagonistic to Martin Luther King Jr., um, very uh, reluctant to have anything to do with the Voting Rights Act, and maybe even worse than that. What is the truth? We turn to Professor uh, Kent Germany. He's an associate professor at the University of South Carolina, and more importantly, perhaps for this project, he's the LBJ White House tape scholar for the University of Virginia's Miller Center for their presidential, very important presidential recordings program. Uh, professor Germany, thank you for joining us this morning. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my delight. So uh, you have listened to the tapes, I'm sure, over and over and over again. Many of them tapes, recorded conversations between President Johnson and Dr. King. Uh, what is the truth about their relationship? Well, the truth about the relationship, I guess as a cop, I'd say that it's complicated. <laughs> um, right. These are two guys that are very powerful. Uh, they have their own constituencies. Uh, you know, Johnson obviously is elected. King's not elected. Um, if, in terms of civil rights, you know, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s power really comes from his ability to talk to the public, to put out an argument that's out there, and to to lead his organization. But he's, you know, he, he's not president of the civil rights movement. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult for him to do something. But Johnson, of course, is president of the United States and has more direct power. And so King has to push Johnson, and Johnson has to be able to tap into that kind of power that King has to put out an argument to the people. Uh, so it, it's a very complicated uh, relationship. Uh, and quite frankly, Johnson, he tried to keep his distance from King, uh, and, and that's something that I think is, is definitely part of the historical record, is that you know he didn't want the public to think that Martin Luther King Jr. was telling him what to do. Uh, you know, he wanted to make sure that, you know, King was there as somebody that was helping a process, but by no means was he the guy calling up Johnson all the time, you know, right. pushing Johnson to do stuff. Well, the one tape that I heard the other night on CBS, and I think you were part of that broadcast, uh, interviewed in that broadcast, is that Johnson seemed to be saying to King, you know, you do what you got to do, right? And I'll do what I got to do, but we don't want anybody to know that we're talking as much as we are, which I I understand would not have been necessarily good for King or good for Johnson. Yeah, you know, for King, one of the things that Johnson had done a few months before this was 
tried to basically shut down the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, and so for a lot of civil rights activists, Lyndon Johnson was this antagonist. He was a guy that was clearly not supporting you know, more militant civil rights activism. Uh, and so for King to be aligned with Johnson really, you know, raises some credibility issues within the civil rights movement for right. him. And so, you know, so King is, is, is a little bit reluctant on his own part. I guess the big question is, would the Voting Rights Act have happened without Lyndon Johnson? Oh, you know, I, it, it definitely wouldn't have happened in the way that it did happen. Um, one thing that Johnson is trying to do is he's trying to stay a step ahead of Bobby Kennedy, uh, and he's also trying to stay a step ahead of the Republican Party. Uh, you know, he's always talking to Republicans on the phone and telling them, you're the party of Lincoln, I know you're the party of Lincoln, I know you want a civil rights bill, I know you want voting rights. And so part of what he's concerned is that the Republican Party will put out their own voting rights bill and, and in some ways kind of steal this issue from the National Democratic Party, because you have these segregationists that are Democrats in the South. So. You know, it's it's a different Republican Party in 1965 than uh, than you would have even a couple of years after that. Well, I had the uh, privilege one evening um, down in Birmingham of listening to uh, the late Jack Valenti um, talk about his experience working with President Johnson to persuade these Southern Democrats. Um, I also saw the great play with Brian Cranston uh, on Broadway. Uh, and I had conversation the other evening with uh, Jim Jones, uh, who was the last uh, chief of staff for Lyndon Johnson. Um, and when you talk to them and you hear them, you certainly get a different portrayal of Johnson's role in the civil rights movement than you get from Selma. So, yeah, so which is the true portrayal here? I mean, can we believe Selma, or was that just sort of a dramatic... Uh, confrontation that they felt they needed to make the movie more interesting? Um, I think part of what is in Selma is a compressing of a number of different things to fit the script. Uh, there, there are some chronological issues where they put events that happen in the film that actually happen before they actually happen. And so there, there are some issues, I think, that, that are there <laughs> that for a historian that, that, that cause some issues. And the, pro the projection of Johnson in the film... I think fit what needed to happen, uh, and in the end, uh, you know, Johnson's speech kind of makes him the person that, that sort of comes around to it. But the historical record is that Johnson was pushing, uh, and, and there's a scene at the beginning of the film with Johnson. What was King. pushing? What's pushing? You mean pushing King? Uh, he was well. He wasn't so much pushing King, but he was pushing his attorney general to put together voting rights legislation, uh, and so. Yeah. In the film, the first scene where Johnson is, where he's saying, you know, we can't do voting rights right now, the actuality is four days before that he had been on the phone with the attorney general saying we've got to do whatever we can do. You know, he's even saying let's make the post office a place where we can register voters because I can mm. control postal employees and I can hire and fire people, and so if they won't do the registration, we'll just get somebody else to do it. And so Johnson wants to have voting rights legislation. Uh, and so the reality is he's been pushing it. He's not necessarily going to go along with exactly what's happening in Selma and wanting to you know, follow along and, and, and push things in, in the exact manner that that's happening. But in terms of the broader issue of voting rights, he's absolutely a voting rights champion. It's, it's good politics, and Johnson understood what good politics were about. Okay, so the bottom line is, if, if you go, if people, are, and I was excited to see the movie, and I've stayed away from it now, because I don't know what to believe, but if you go see Selma, right, can you believe that as a historical truth? Uh, no, it's not a historical, you know, it's a film, and it is a, it's fictional, it's a dramatic rendering of historical events, uh, it's not a historical documentary. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have to go in and know that, you know, there are things to fit a story into two hours that have to happen uh, that I wouldn't do as a historian. Uh, you know, there's a balance between getting it right and not being boring. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. that, that's an issue uh, that's, that's at play. But I would say go and listen to the tapes yourself. Uh, go mm -hmm. and watch the Eyes on the Prize documentary that, that's the episode on, uh, on Selma uh, and, and really see the actual historical figures. 
um, and, and use the Selma film as a way to really dig into that history because I think the history itself is really even more exciting than the film is. The film's a nice a good introduction point. to it. Now, t- tell us, where can people get access to the tapes? Uh, you can go to uh, whitehousetapes.net or you can go to millercenter.org. Uh, org. Okay. Uh, and there are uh, King and Johnson conversations. There are lots of uh, Johnson mm-hmm. conversations about civil rights. Right. Miller uh, Center. Even things yeah. about Johnson ordering pants. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, we have those tapes and we play them often. We love that. A little extra... Uh, inch or, or so down the... the well, we won't go into all the details, of that, but we play them off. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about, Professor. Uh, it's so good to have you with us. And again, it's MillerCenter.org, correct? Yes, that's correct. All right, Professor Kent Germany joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me. That's all for AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Mike Barnes, Eric Posner, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate.